voted the greatest song of the 20th century by the National Endowment of Arts, as well as the Recording Artists Association of America, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, just continues to have incredible sway on our lives. You may wonder, like, why is it uh, so appealing to us? Uh, you know, what is it about the song that makes us, you know, just uh, resonate so closely with it? And one of the things that you find is that there is in it this universal appeal, really, that uh, whatever concerns that you're up against, that we all can resonate with a desire for a better place, a better life, uh, that there is the, the sense that there's got to be some place, something that's better. A song was written in 1939. It was almost left out of the, uh, uh, the movie, uh, Wizard of Oz. And uh, right at the last minute, someone argued and kind of leveraged to get it in. Of course, the song became the signature song in the career of Judy Garland. Uh, it um, Basically, some thought, you know, written in 1939, that behind it was kind of the concerns about Nazi Germany starting to kind of rumble. And uh, others thought it was the suffering of the Great Depression that maybe is reflected. And others have simply noted that it's general enough where anyone from uh, wrestling with any concern, any kind of anxiety, uh, mixing with hope, would really, you know, resonate with, with the song. I, I find it fascinating that there was a line, uh, it was really the first line of the song that was not included in the song in the movie, but in theatrical productions it was added. And it's uh, simply a line that says this, is, is when all the world is a hopeless jumble. That kind of set the, the, the tone for the song. When all of the world is a hopeless jumble. I don't, we don't use the word jumble, but we all know the idea of hopelessness. And when you think that uh, you know, whatever you're facing, that there is this longing, I think universally, there is this sense like, you know, where can we go? You know, somewhere over the rainbow where the skies are blue. And the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. You think of a, uh, maybe a nine-year-old who sits on uh, his, her bed upstairs listens to mom, dad fighting again, just yelling at each other. And though he may articulate it differently inside his own heart, he longs for a place that's different. He longs for something uh, different than, than that place that he finds himself. You think of the teenager who comes home from yet another day of bullying at school, where they're making fun of her for uh, her appearance or for the color of her skin, or for whatever reason. And she, she sits there with this internal struggle. And she wonders, like, is, there not, is there not a better place? Is there, is there somewhere where the dream of a better life really does come true? Think of the woman who works hard to try to get ahead in her career. And uh, she's taken advantage of by the powerful executives above her. And as she comes home as a single parent and tries to take care of all the other responsibilities and wrestles with the weight of that. And she thinks, like, this is just so wrong. Like, isn't there, isn't there a better place? Isn't there something better? A refugee family comes. And uh, they are caught in between a desire from the country for a, a very compassionate welcome, as well as a concern like how do we protect ourselves from people who wish us harm. And they get caught in that crossfire and they, they, they think, is there not a place? Is there not some place where people who dare to dream see their dreams really do come true? Well, God sees all of that. And he has actually done something to enter into our brokenness and not only to bring forgiveness for our rebellion but also to start rebuilding this place in fact what we're going to see as we begin a study in the book of ephesians is that god has created something that may not initially excite your heart but let me, what we're going to see today is that it excited the heart 
not only of the original hearers, but the entire heavenly audience. That God was creating something called the church. And that with the church, that God was going to use that to connect people to faith in Christ. And not only promise this new world to come, but in the meantime, create a place where we can experience and offer to others a taste of the kind of life that God designed for us to experience. All right, that, that's what we're going to see today. I want you to open up to Ephesians, and you'll, you'll notice here that in your translation, it's, uh, the book is addressed uh, to the Ephesians. Let me tell you a little bit about Ephesus. In fact, first point I want you to consider this morning is what I would just call, you know, this, this disturbing anarchy. Disturbing anarchy. And so that you understand how I'm using that word, let me show you a, kind of a definition of the word anarchy. First of all, uh, one use is political and social disorder due to the absence of government control. Now that's what we would call political anarchy, and that's not what I'm talking about. Not talking about that. Instead, I'm talking about what you might call spiritual anarchy. In fact, another definition uh, the dictionary gives is this. It's confusion and disorder. And then notice in yellow, what you've got is uh, what the dictionary offered as a sample sentence using the word. And it says, uh, intellectual and moral anarchy followed his loss of faith. Uh, and that actually is a sample sentence that kind of fits the way I'm using it. Because you see, in the beginning, God actually created mankind with a desire to really bless him. To, to, frankly, to just bless the socks off him. His intent was blessing for mankind. And uh, that involved perfect harmony and relationship with God, his creator, as well as relation, perfect relationship with, with spouse and family and children and work and environment. And I mean, you go on and on. It's just, it's perfect. But believe it or not, Genesis 3 tells us that mankind surprisingly rebelled against that perfect environment. Believing the lie that God was holding out on them. And as a result, we all kind of went our own way. We kind of followed our first parents and going our own way to try to make life happen on our own. The result of that was brokenness enters human experience. That our relationship with God is broken, and because of that, our relationship with each other and our spouse and our family and work and the environment, like everything is broken. And it, it's, it's terrible. And God could have said, hey, you made your bed, now lie in it. But instead, because he loved us, he said, I'm going to set into motion a plan to bring about your rescue. Not only forgiveness for your rebellion, but also I'm going to give you freedom from living in this kind of broken place. I'm going to do a work. And so he sends Jesus to die on the cross and raise him from the dead. And Jesus sent us his spirit, as we've learned recently, uh, to walk and to live with him. Now, all of that said is this, is that God sees us, cares about us, and has done something to provide a place. Now, a church, the church is not a building. The church is a gathering, it's the assembling together of Christ followers. That when we come together, that there is this thing called the ecclesia, the church, the gathering, the assembly, where we come together and that God has ordained from eternity past, what you're going to see today, from eternity past that God has put together and planned the creation of this thing that we call the church to offer to the world a different place. Not somewhere over the rainbow, but somewhere around the corner where people can actually begin to live and to start tasting and experiencing life the way God intended it to be as we wait for his return, uh, where he's going to you know, change the whole world. So I kinda, that's kind of where we're going. So we look, first of all, at this disturbing anarchy. In Ephesus, just a, a word about the city of Ephesus. Ephesus probably at this time was about 300,000 people. It was, uh, it was on uh, the western uh, uh, end of a Asia, Minor, uh, Asia Minor, probably uh, present-day Turkey, and uh, it sat there on the coast, and uh, because of the problem with the eroding, 
and uh, the silting of the, of the bay, it, 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 uh, it became less effective as a port, but it was still a major thoroughfare for several ancient roads that would lead through Ephesus. So it was a wealthy city, is my point with all of that. And some of their wealth was not only through trade, but they made a lot of money off of the idolatry in the city. It was the place where the temple of Artemis was located. Artemis was the Greek name. The Latin name was uh, uh, Diana, who was a fertility goddess. Uh, she was worshipped kind of similar to uh, uh, like Mother Nature or uh, the, the one who would bring about fertility. And part of that worship involved uh, sexual experiences of various kinds. And it was just a, a incredible, uh, incredibly uh, distorted uh, kind of religion. And so there was this materialism too that said about that. In fact, if you took the time to read in Acts chapter 19, when Paul and his team went into Ephesus and started the preaching of the Bible, started the preaching of the gospel, and the church started, that many, many people began to turn away from a lot of this dark stuff that was uh, prevalent in the city. So much so that the merchants gathered together, and you can look at Acts 19, and they, they basically say, hey, listen, like we make no small profit off this idolatry. And people are turning away because of this Paul, and they basically provoke a citywide mob and riot in the city of Ephesus that leads to uh, persecution for Paul. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, they, there, there's a lot of stuff that's just crazy here. They are in anarchy, having committed, like you and me, high treason against God our creator and gone our own way and created brokenness. And then there were people there who, in feeling that brokenness, long for a day. They long for some new place, something different. Well, what about from Ephesus to America? I mean, we don't have to spend a lot of time here to catalog the brokenness in our country. That we know this kind of spiritual, intellectual, moral anarchy ourselves. You think just, just in the last year, just recently, the whole uh, uh, Me Too movement where many women have come forward exposing just the uh, sexual misconduct and abuse of people in media and uh, in Hollywood and in politicians and in athletics and in the church. And it's just, it, it's just incredible. I mean, it's like every few weeks we learn of some formerly high-respected individual. So what is it about these guys to think that they have the right? And then you move uh, from that, you just, you just listen to the tone of dialogue in our country. How uncivil we are toward one another. That we can no longer just talk about differences in ideology. I have to personally attack you. It is so ugly. Now let me tell you, I've read enough history. I can tell you about different campaigns, Andrew Jackson, and even, even before that. I mean, in every campaign that what candidates would do is, is ugly. And, you know, it was, but I tell you what, I have never witnessed from the point that I started paying attention what I see in our country it is incredible. Where uh, our uh, elite academic institutions used to pride themselves on tolerance and giving a platform for all points of view, that's no longer the case. Uh, all you have now is a rejection of anyone who doesn't represent the, 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 you know, the, the popular point of view on that campus. And people are violent. Uh, the tone is just incredible. I think about racism in our country. And like it just continues to be a big issue. And we think, like, what in the world is going to bring about a solution for that? So in one night, a black man gets pulled over because of the color of his skin. And the next block over or the next city over, a white police officer gets gunned down. Black lives matter, blue lives matter. Like what? 
I, the brokenness in our world is incredible. It is this anarchy where someone, a student, comes home from school confused about their identity and their sexuality, thinking, who do I need to be? What can I make? My, you know, who, who do I need to be in order to find some kind of love, some kind of belonging? And like people live in this place and they think, where in the world do I find the kind of life that I long for? Where is it that there is something different offered? Something in keeping with not my, only God's design, but my dreams in themselves. And that's kind of the anarchy that we face. And God looks down from heaven and he sees that. And let me tell you, you can be assured that he cares a great deal about it. In fact, from the eternity past, he set in motion a plan to provide for us a place. Temporarily here in his church, and uh, eventually and eternally in the world to come that he's going to bring when he returns. So what is this church? What, what, what's made? Well, as we begin our study of Ephesians, let me just give you an overview of the book. It's a very high level, very simple overview of the book. In the first uh, three chapters, this is what I would call a determined alternative because we're going to see that, that this, all, this attractive alternative that God intends, the, the church, was predetermined, and uh, I, I want us to kind of take a look at that. The first three chapters of Ephesians are really, uh, could be described as the creation of the church, the creation of the church. The second three chapters is the conduct of the church, all right? So the creation of the church, like, like when, when was this thing, uh, you know, conceived in the heart and mind of God? Like one of the things that you're going to find throughout the book of, of, of Ephesians is the repetition of a surprising word, a word that you don't find that much elsewhere, but in Ephesians, you'll find it seven times. It's the word mystery, that the revelation of the church, we're told, is formally a mystery. In fact, let me just show you uh, by way of intro in chapter three. This is one of the occurrences where he talks about this. And uh, he's talking about, I'll pick up with verse 8 of chapter 3. I'm sorry I don't have this for you on the screen. But uh, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, Paul the apostle is talking, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, I don't know if you catch all that, but he basically he's talking about this creation of the church. He says it was a mystery, and now it's being revealed, it's being made known. And what's fascinating, too, is that it's not just for our viewing pleasure. It says that there are spiritual forces so he says, so that all the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places might see. Do you know that whatever God had in mind about this church, that it was going to be so amazing that the whole heavenly audience would stand up and take notice and be blown away by it? And I think probably our understanding of church has not quite met the reaction of, of the heavenly audience. But yet that's what God intended. Th that when you understand what he had in mind, it is so incredible. It has been a mystery. Now, when you think about mystery, you can think about something that is, you know, hard to understand. It, it's hard to explain. It's mysterious. Or you can think about mystery in the sense of not being hard to explain. It's just that it was unknown. It was like a divine secret. And when the word mystery is used in the book of Ephesians in this way, it's not hard to understand what God intends with the church, but it was hidden. It was secret. Now, <clears throat> Kathy and I, we had a mystery yesterday. And uh, <laughs> I just want you to know she's given me permission. But uh, it was a mystery that happened that was unknown to me. And then we go out to dinner last night with some friends and she begins to tell this story. She says, oh, well, uh, I haven't told Danny this. 
But today, I was backing out of the garage, uh, kind of backed out of the garage, and um, I saw that how, how bad our flowers were, and they need water, and so I stopped and got out of the car to go turn on the, you know, the little thing, the irrigation. And so, uh, as she does that, she's over doing that, and the wind, I guess, blows her car door shut, and the car starts moving forward fast into the garage, crashing into our garbage cans. It's not big a deal. You know, she's fine. She wasn't even in the car. But what's most interesting is she says, first of all, the mystery that I, I hadn't heard about this yet. And then the mystery where she had, you know, she was in reverse and she stops. She's not really sure, like, how could the car start going forward? She can't figure that out. And she said, it's a mystery. In fact, when we got home, because she had not even looked at the car, and we got home and found some dents in the front of the car. She told me, it's okay, it's dents. She said, I can see her just as clear as I see you. She's in the garage and she says, it's a mystery. <laughs> now, mystery, as we're learning for the church, is something that was unknown. And when God starts unveiling this, it's a huge, huge thing. Now listen, before we go forward, I just want you to begin entertaining the idea that maybe we have lost a little bit of what God had in mind for the church. That perhaps we have dimmed the incredible, lofty idea of what God had in mind when he created the church. Now, the church, we're told, was to be the city on the hill, the shining star, you know. The church was to be salt and light in the world. It was to be a, um, a kingdom of priests. It was to be the body of Christ. It is to be, uh, you know, something that was so exalted in the mind of Christ that that's what he has in mind. In fact, let me read you one of my favorite quotes. This is from a guy named Stephen Nichols. Stephen Nichols did a book, uh, basically uh, somewhat of uh, a uh, commentary on the writings of Jonathan Edwards, okay? You know, uh, 18th century uh, theologian. And uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards uh, writes about uh, life here between heaven and earth, you know, that we live in this world, we're waiting for the world to come and living in between uh, how do we live out heaven on earth? And listen to what he says. He's talking about this. Stephen Nichols says, this is our calling, reflecting on the writings of, of Jonathan Edwards. He says, our calling is to show the citizens of these earthly and temporal countries that there is a far better eternal country. In the words of C.S. Lewis, we are to point out to those who live in the shadow lens that there is a real world to come. But we are to do more than that. Now, here's the key point I want to make. We're to do more than that. We best point the way to the world to come when we offer glimpses of that world in this one. That is what the church is supposed to be. That the real place over the rainbow, the world to come, that Christ is going to bring, like it's future. But in the meantime, right now, their church is designed to offer to the world the early glimpses of what life can be. It's our job to connect people to the king so that they can be part of the kingdom when he returns. It's our job to offer a rest place, an oasis, an imperfect, this side of heaven, no doubt about it, imperfect. But for right now, a place where people can experience, can begin to taste and dare to dream their dreams of what life could be. The church will not be around forever. Do you know that? That one day the church is going to leave planet Earth. Christ is going to snatch it up. And at that point, the Holy Spirit and its restraining force through the church is gone. And evil will run rampant 
on planet earth for seven years. The church is not forever. But the church has a very important purpose right now. And yet many of us have kind of a nonchalant. And uh, when I say many of us, I'm not necessarily talking about you. I'm preaching to the choir here. But uh, when you, many people in our world today, today ha, are, are very uh, discouraged by the church. They're very turned off by the institutional church. They want to identify it that way. Many people would say, you know, I'm pro-Jesus. I like Jesus, but not crazy about the church. And we understand why. I mean, history has revealed there's some things where things done in the name of church or in the name of Christ have, have been difficult and hurtful, and I'm not going to take time to recount all of that. But the church sometimes is viewed. I think it's changing, but historically, in the last decade, it's been viewed as, as, as condemning and judgmental and uh, not interested in really the problems in our world around us. They're only interested in kind of growing and getting big and taking care of one another, you know, hour four and no more. And so the world has had kind of a PR, and the church has had a PR problem. And so, uh, you know, because of that, many people are not so committed to the church as well. You know, some people, regular church attendance is showing up about once a month. Not really doing much, but just showing up. In fact, one author this week released a book called Quit Church. And he's being facetious once you read through the article or the preview on the book. But he's basically saying that when, when people, uh, their experience or commitment to church is one of sporadic attendance, no involvement, no service, no giving, no working through the church to uh, share the gospel. Like They're just completely in that. He says, they may think that they're the church, but if that's their understanding of church, they need to quit. You know, let's quit that kind of idea of church. Now, God has blessed us with, with people so committed to, to our church here. And I feel like, you know, we're an exception to some of what he's saying. But you guys all know you have friends. You have people who, you know, church is just not a big deal. And let me tell you, again, church is not a building. Church is a commitment and assembling together of people who bring their variety of spiritual gifts under the leadership of uh, Jesus Christ, the head of our church, to accomplish his will in a broken world. And that is what God has in mind. So, uh, uh, you know, let me move a little bit further and just ask this. Well, how do we recover what Jesus had in mind? Well, let's start about what God did when he started creating the church. As I mentioned, he spends three chapters on the identity of the church. There's the, you know, the, the creation of the church, which is really all about our identity. And then the conduct of the church, which is all about activity. You know, how do we live this out? So in the creation of the church, the first thing you discover is that the creator of the church is none other than God himself. And it is the Godhead in full. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are involved. And, and uh, the, the first thing that we need to understand is that when it comes to church, it's about who? <coughs> Excuse me. It's about like who is, uh, makes up the church. And then who created the church and why did he create the church? And so we move to this last part called the divine assembly. And we, we discover three things. So in verses 3 through uh, 14, we find the answers to these questions. Because if you're going to go back to the design, you start with, okay, what did he have in mind? Who makes up the church? And so back in chapter 1, starting with verse 3, we read this. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, there's language there that feels weird. Like, okay, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Well, that language speaks to our position. That in Christ, there is a spiritual reality of truth that has uh, now become ours. So we, we have this... Um, spiritual position before God, that I'm in Christ, and that all his blessings and riches in Christ has been given to us. And this spiritual realm factors into the book of Ephesians many times. Here, in our spiritual blessings, chapter 6, our spiritual battle. And so, like, there's this whole unseen world that's watching what the church is doing and what God is doing. And so he, he says that by way of intro. 
He blesses with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Okay, let me stop right there. Here we see the role of the Father, the role of God the Father, and we see he, what his job is, is that uh, glory to, to God the Father for selecting us. All right, so his, his role is selecting us. And you'll notice that uh, it says, uh, to the praise of his glorious grace. So glory to the Father who selected us. Now, you know, you may have picked up language about that he's the one who chose us. Uses the word, he predestined us. Uh, later in talking about Jesus, he'll talk about uh, predestined again. And, and sometimes we, we get really confused about that. And, and let me just say just a couple of things that you uh, need to keep in mind. There are two truths that you have to embrace together. You can't embrace just one. You've got to embrace both truths. And then is this, is that God, in terms of uh, saving us, involves both his choice, his selection, and our involvement in that through faith, through belief. Like we are appealed to, to believe. And if we don't believe, we're not going to be saved. But we, we discover that those who believe are those who are called. Now, you, you may feel like it's paradoxical. But just because we find trouble reconciling it, uh, and, and by the way, um, I think the best book I've ever read on this, if you want to make a note of, is a book by Norm Geisler called Chosen But Free. But watch how these verses that you have to hold together. Let me show you John 3.16. We know this verse. We love this verse. For so, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, what? Believes. Will not perish but have everlasting life. There you read that and you think, okay, the responsibility is on the believer to choose to believe. But just a few chapters later, you read John 6, where Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. The Father selects us, and somehow using the free choices of man, God sovereignly brings about his will. Let me show you one other verse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through what? Sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Like, you got to believe. You got to choose to believe. So, uh, there are much more to be said on all of that, but what we need to understand today is this, is that when God was creating the church, it's made up of people First of all, that the Father chooses and to his glory. The Father selects. Some of you have uh, bad memories of being in the, uh, uh, you know, the, pre the, uh, uh, re um, the, the field at school where you have re re uh, recess. That's the word I'm looking for. And, uh, you know, they're choosing sides for softball or soccer or whatever. And, and you're thinking, man, is anyone going to pick me? And these two captains and they're picking and, and man, everybody's getting picked and you're not getting picked. And you're thinking, well, why would anyone pick me? I mean, what do I have to offer? I'm slow and, you know, I'm not very coordinated and, you know, I've got wear glasses. And so you're thinking that and you're feeling really bad. And, but then the next time you come out and there's a captain who right away says, man, I want you on the team. So I'll pick you. And you're thinking to yourself, Why? Would you do that? You see, we, we don't have anything in us that commends us to God for him to choose us. In fact, let me tell you, if you don't know already, one of the first requirements of becoming a Christian is to understand your spiritual poverty. When Jesus says in the, uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit. Like he's talking about like people who understand I've got nothing to offer God. And the only reason why he would pick me is just to highlight and spotlight his grace. Which is, if you'll notice, the very thing that he says. Uh, uh, concluding the section about the Father, it says, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he blessed us in the Beloved. 
And so who is the divine assembly? Uh, there, it's glory to the Father who selected us. Second, it's glory to the Son who saved us. Glory to the Son who saved us. And so you've, we continue reading verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. Redemption is the idea of being purchased. Um, you know, I redeem that coupon. I redeem this product. I, it's the idea of purchase out of the marketplace of sin. Uh, many have said. It's, it's the idea of Christ died, that he spit his blood. That was the price he paid to uh, redeem us from our rebellious, broken position. As a result of that, we have forgiveness for our sins. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Again, his grace is highlighted which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. That's the first occurrence of the word mystery. The mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of times to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of, of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So just like the father is praised, the son is praised for what he did. Okay, uh, two things that I'll highlight from this. Number one is you find out that Jesus paid the price for us. He, he, he made a purchase through, uh, with his blood to buy you and to buy me. Uh, uh, to pay the debt that we could not pay. And so the second thing is that the whole thing was prearranged. The whole thing was set up from eternity past, the payment for us. So like, this is a huge thing. So what you owe because of our sin, what I owe, that's a debt that was not only paid, but it was prearranged. Now, uh, one year, Kathy and I went up to Dallas and we were uh, at this big conference, pastor's conference. There was probably 1,500 of us in this big auditorium. Uh, we were listening in one of the general sessions to a guy named uh, Tony Campolo. Campolo, maybe you know that name. But, so he comes back after lunch. He's about to begin a, a next general session. So we're all sitting in there. And he says, well, before I begin, I just want you to know that, uh, you know, I've got something to say. I'm really sensing, and he's kind of having fun with this, is I'm really sensing that there's somebody here today that God wants to go see the Dallas Cowboys. Now, you know, I was living in Austin. I'm a big Cowboys fan. I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> how cool is that? And he says, yeah, I, so I've got these tickets. And I, now, who do these tickets go to? And he's kind of thinking, and let me tell you, there's cowboy fans all over the auditorium. So, like, everybody's kind of raising their hand, and like, trying to figure out, like, how can I m maneuver here? And he says, okay, I've got the name. Box. Is there a Danny Box here? And, like, I'm blown away. I said, you've got to be kidding. And so, like, I get up, I walk down, and Tony Capone, he hands me these tickets, and he says, man, here are the tickets. You couldn't have paid for these? And I said, absolutely, I could not have paid for those. But not only have they been prepaid, this whole thing has been prearranged. Like your wife was in on it. You don't have to be back Sunday to teach. You're going to be in a hotel tonight. You're going to go to the Cowboys game tomorrow. Like it's all prepaid and prearranged. I could not have done anything to get it. That's what Jesus has done for us. He's prearranged, prepaid. And for all of us who respond in faith, that Jesus saves us from our sin. And again, ultimately for his glory, it says. And then finally, you move to the role of the Spirit. Now, we've looked at these verses recently in our series on the Holy Spirit, but let's review them quickly. It says in uh, verse 13, In him... Talking about in Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, 
who was the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now we're told here that at the moment of believing that God's spirit enters your life and seals you as a guarantee for your future deliverance. In other words, what we're told is like the spirit secures us and again to the praise of his glory. Uh, the timing point is important. It uses this phrase, uh, when you believed, um, that you were sealed, uh, say, and the word of, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you heard that, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So this is all about security, okay? This is about being sealed by the Spirit and being secured for our future. That's his point about guarantee. It's like when you drop something in the mail, like it's, it's gone, like it's, it's gonna go. If you do your taxes with TurboTax or some online tool, if uh, you're like the one I use, when you get to the very end, when it's all said and done, everything's filled out and you've verified your identity and you signed and, and you got all the payment ready to go and then it says, okay, when you click on this button, it's all gone, it's all over. You can't reverse it, you can't go back. It's like dropping it off in a mailbox, it says. And so make sure you're ready to go. When you hit it, it's gone. Like it's going. And when we place your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit clicks that button, like I'm stamped into you, and like we're going. We're on our way to heaven. Your whole eternal destiny is changed. So these are the people this is how God began creating this incredible thing called the church, what is to be an attractive alternative to the world around us. Let me just say, if you've ever looked in a museum, been at a museum for an unveiling of a piece of art, or maybe you've seen this portrayed on television, and you know, there's all this anticipation for this painting, you know, spotlights down on it, you know, people are waiting to see the thing unveiled. And when the moment finally comes and the painting is revealed and it's just beautiful and people are taken back and there's this visible, audible reaction to the beauty of this painting that very, very quickly the attention moves from the art to the artist. And that's the one that receives the glory. And when we think today, about the beautiful thing that God had in mind when he created the church, we move very quickly from the church to the creator. He's the one that gets the glory. Glory to the Father who selected us. Glory to the Son who saved us. Glory to the Spirit who still us. Let's pray. Oh, Father, um, as we come before you, we just give you thanks again, God, for uh, what you're teaching us about your Spirit. And we pray, God, that you would just refresh in our own hearts and minds, just renew within us an excitement about what you had in mind, that, God, you, you have called us at this time and in, in, uh, place in history to be part of what you envisioned from eternity past, something that would come and help people connect to Jesus. We pray, God, that you would excite us about that and teach us in Jesus' name.